Hello, um, and welcome to the Building Centre. I am Colin Tweedy, and I'm Chief Executive of the Building Centre and of the Built Environment Trust. And it's five months ago now that I actually formally opened the um, retrofit exhibition um, upstairs. And though this is the last of the um, physical talks um, for this Retrofit 24, the exhibition runs until the end of August. So please um, go and see it again tonight, but also for the, for the next month. And as I said, this has been a journey for the Building Centre. We started last year when John Bonning and his um, um, colleague Laura Broderick led on Retrofit 23 and this Retrofit 24 which is about commercial, cultural and civic buildings and the building centre has learnt a lot from the, the work we've done talking to you, the professionals in, in this area and so this evening it is a um, Though it's sad that it's the last of the sessions, and obviously it was shoved back because of the football, and we didn't even win the, anyway. Um, though I know it was against the Dutch, which we did, but I know nothing about football, so I should keep my mouth firmly shut. But this um, discussion tonight is, is about ESG, environmental, social and government drivers in the Redfield projects. And of course, since... Um, well, it's only is it like 10 days since we had a new government, but this government has certainly hit the ground running, and so, so much of what um, you are talking about is so relevant to what I know the new government wants to have on its agenda. To set the scene and to chair the session, I'm delighted that Smith Mordack, Chief Executive of the UK for Green Building Council, um, is, is going to chair. And before we start, just some housekeeping. There are no um, fire alarms planned, so if the fire alarm goes off, please leave, leave the building. There are um, there's stairs to the left, stairs straight up, and assemble in the, in, in the courtyard. And, um, and obviously, as I'm sure you all know nowadays, please turn your mobiles off or to um, without sound. Um, Smith was telling me that, reminding me that they have, you've been here now a year, and how long has the UK Green Building Council been in this building? It must be... Since the beginning, so since 2007. So you are our oldest and most treasured partner. Mm -hmm. Though, as an organisation, you've yeah, often... <laughs> yes, but, uh, but as an organisation, um, UK Green Build Council often questioned our own um, footprint. And we keep saying, unfortunately, we don't own the building, it's owned by the Corporation of London. And you might say, why does the Corporation of London own, they own a lot of um, Tottenham Court Road and bits of... Um, of Oxford Street, and they actually said they either won it on the death of Richard II, they acquired this land, or a gambling debt in the 18th century, but I gather records do not find, but we know that our landlord is, is um, the Corporation of London, who we often say, you know, can we do more greening of the building, and they say, no, but I think they're moving in the right direction. So, Smith has held, I'm reading this because I'll get it wrong otherwise, has held leadership roles in architecture and engineering for many years. Um, they have assumed auth authorship for several initiative reports, including at COP26 in Glasgow. And Smith has also held a range of positions in which they have campaigned from transition to a more sustainable future. And Smith has contributed regularly to national and trade press. So, Thank you, Smith, and thank you for your leadership of UK Green Building Council and our most treasured and <laughs> tenant. So I think I introduce you to lead off and introduce the speakers. And thank you all for attending tonight. And I'm glad um, 
there's no sporting event to um, interrupt Afrosin. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, thanks for hanging out with us in a basement on, I think, the first warm evening this summer. Um, it's still going to be at least 25 degrees after we're finished outside, so you're fine. Just stick with us. Um, so, yeah, so as Colin said, so I'm Smith, uh, Mordak, they, them, and I'm Chief Exec at the UK Green Building Council. Um, and retrofit is our great passion. <laughs> um, and I guess I wanted to say a couple of things to set the scene in terms of recent work that we've done before inviting our wonderful panellists to come and share some presentations and then we'll have a conversation and um, there'll be a chance to ask them questions or chat to each other um, until we go out to the balmy evening. Um, so the UKGBC, ahead of COP26, created a whole life carbon roadmap, which I was actually involved with with my previous hat on um, as Director of Sustainability at Bureau Hapold. Um, and this whole life carbon map roadmap was essentially charting a trajectory from where we were then to 2050, how do we get to net zero as a built environment? Um, and obviously a huge part of that work was looking at well, baselining where are we now and where are all the emissions according to it, it, within the built environment. And a huge, 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 huge part of that is our existing buildings. 80% of our existing buildings are, sorry, 80% of the buildings that are gonna exist in 2050 have already been built. So we cannot get to net zero without retrofitting our existing buildings. As exciting as, you know, sexy new buildings are, it's so, so important that we look at existing buildings. And as obviously we all know, there is far too little coming forward um, in terms of projects around retrofitting existing buildings. Like, and obviously, yes, we still sort of, we've seen the conversation evolve a little bit over the last couple of years since, since COP26 um, in terms of, you know, thinking about things like M&S where we sort of see big debates about like, well, should we knock it down and start again or should we retrofit it? And that's great and it's really important that we're sort of thinking much more carefully about um, existing buildings. I still don't think that conversation is happening enough. Um, when we're looking at potential new projects. But what we're still not seeing is like the huge, like the 28 million homes around the UK are still largely like not, there's, there's no strategic plan to retrofit those homes. Um, we at UKGBC um, have created a calculator uh, where you can play treasurer, um, play chancellor, um, and basically have a look at like, well, okay, what is my strategy to retrofit all of these homes? How much uh, public investment do we need? How much private investment? What kind of policies and so on could we um, implement in order to create that? And we estimate that we need about 64 billion pounds over 10 years um, to <laughs> retrofit our homes. This is a huge sum of money, obviously, um, but um, it's so important and literally, if unless, we retrofit our homes, the only way we're getting to net zero is to turn off everyone's heating, and I don't think that's what we want to do. <laughs> um, that's mean. Um, so I think it's, it's so, so important that we talk about retrofit um, in a more uh, holistic way, not only thinking about kind of, well, I'll take this building, shall I knock it down and start again, or should, but actually how do we, as built environment, as the built environment industry, deploy our skills across the whole breadth of the built environment. We did an update, a sort of tracking progress update to our whole life carbon roadmap um, just before COP28 and um, it should have been, we should have been about 19%, uh, seen about 19% reduction between the COP26 and COP28 and we saw about 13% and that sounds like, okay, that's not too bad, it's not all the way there, but you know, these are small numbers. Um, the problem is, is that that 13% was pretty much due to a pandemic shutting down a lot of things um, and also sort of recent reductions in emissions from the built environment are a lot to do with energy price rises. So basically what we're seeing is that this is a symptom of crippling fuel poverty rather than actually sort of behaviour change and energy efficiency measures and so on. And the CCC's report, sorry, Committee for Climate Change's report to Parliament that was um, published this morning also talks about this as like, yes, we have seen that buildings have reduced their emissions, but so much of that is because of energy price rises rather than kind of concerted action. And it's really interesting to see that they have, like their recommendations to government include a lot of things to do with retrofitting uh, commercial buildings, public buildings, and of course homes. So I think we are seeing more signals and kind of uh, 
uh, energy and ambition from the new government and the previous government around actually taking retrofit seriously. I hope that we as an industry are ready to act on that and I know that our fine panellists absolutely are and are leading the way. Um, so yeah, I think I'll probably stop chatting now. Um, and first I'm going to introduce Ed Wieland, who has an excellent job title, Chief Innovation Officer at Longevity Partners and I think we definitely need lots of innovation and longevity. So thank you for bringing that. <laughs> so Ed's been working in sustainability for over 15 years as a chartered engineer and as a sustainability consultant. In his current role, Ed is responsible for shaping Longevity Partners' approach to innovation. Um, his fo work focuses on making buildings and client investment more sustainable, concentrating on net zero strategies, energy efficiency, and enhancing health and air quality. Egged, uh, egg. Ed <laughs> regularly connects with universities, research groups, and industry leaders to keep Longevity's ideas fresh and influential. So, you're up. Thanks, Smith. So, <clears throat> A um, few caveats. I'm, I'm an engineer by background, um, but I'm here to talk primarily about the commercial side rather than the social um, side of this. And by being an engineer, I will probably tend to focus more on the E part of the S&G, even though really a lot of my clients are, uh, are equally focused on the other parts of it. So I'm here to give, I guess, an insight into how real estate is treating retrofit um, and why I think there's some reasons to be hopeful um, from a number of uh, from a number of angles so I, I my background is very much in the um, the construction space so I was a, a sustainability consultant at a engineering firm for a long time and I mostly um, came into contact with the development manager part of the real estate industry so the construction industry um, which is I think what most of you are used to. Um, but behind that, there's a whole number of people um, providing the money for these funds who have um, different drivers related to ESG. So starting at the top, investors, so that's generally pension funds, insurance funds, can be private individuals, um, can be listed companies um, on the stock exchange. And they're generally the ones that are driving the ESG agenda within real estate asset managers. So th there, there are ESG teams within these firms that have often a background similar to mine or to architecture or something like that who, who are coming up with policies to meet these investors' demands and they're feeding them into their fund managers which then flows down to development projects or retrofit projects. So a lot of that is coming from the investors themselves. So this is uh, a screen grab from a, uh, an ESG strategy from a Canadian pension fund and it's pretty ambitious. It's talking mostly about the money side of it, how much money they want to invest in transition assets. So a transition asset is an asset that needs retrofit, effectively. Um, and their ambition is to increase their investment in that. And what that means is that they, there is money going into asset management firms who then will have money to retrofit. So at a very high level, they're thinking about this sort of things. Similarly, uh, reducing holdings in carbon intensive uh, assets, there's one way of doing that and that's to sell them, the other way is to retrofit them and obviously increasing in green assets. So if you've got un, uh, unretrofit projects, then once they've been retrofitted in, in the investment world they become green and, and they become more attractive. So why are they interested, why are the investors interested in it? It's all about regulation. So there's been a huge increase, particularly since about 2018, in the level of scrutiny of, uh, of environmental performance across the financial world, um, and particularly in real estate, uh, the EU taxonomy, if you're familiar, familiar with that, TCFD, SFRD, a world of acronyms that all really comes down to energy data, water data, waste data, carbon data. So then all of this is now visible, and the investors who are effectively fund managers, building owners, clients, are um, are asking them how good is your fund, how good are your buildings, so that they can compare them to their um, competitors and investors the ones that they see as the ones that they see as lowest risk. So when I talk about, when I say risk in the context of investment, it's, it's largely around two things in real estate. So transition risk, which is that pathway to net zero. So Smith mentioned the um, UKGBC's work of setting what a 
what the pathway should be a little while back. A lot of organizations around the world have done that. Um, CREM, if you've come across that acronym, has kind of compiled a lot of those together, and that's the main tool that the real estate industry uses to judge whether a building is uh, stranded. If you've come across that term, that means it's either, that means it's not on a pathway to net zero or, uh, or on that pathway. And the second part is physical risk. So obviously there's a huge increase in uh, climate related <laughs> overheating, flood, uh, wildfires in parts of the world, not so much in the UK, thankfully. Um, and they also, particularly the insurers um, and pension funds who are long-term investors, don't want to invest in a building that has high physical risk. Um, there are many other um, areas that investors are particularly interested in, uh, and the ULI have done a good job um, in their sea change program of wrapping all those together um, and trying to put a value to it. So what investors are mostly interested in is how will these things impact on the value of their assets. So how do they then, how does that start to flow into, into the construction world? So this is a, a, a grab from the CREM tool um, for a portfolio that we look after um, that shows how over time assets become stranded. So how they, um, how they become candidates for retrofit is one way of doing it, or uh, the other way of doing it is to just offload them. The thing with a building that is stranded, it has what is known in the real estate industry as a brown discount. In order for that building to become useful uh, to become um, marketable to tenants in the future, it needs to be retrofit. You need to invest that money in it in order to make it uh, a, a kind of commercially viable building. So that's the whole part around transition risk. The next stage of that is, is what kind of retrofit you can do. So once the client's decided to do a retrofit, the UKGBC have done a nice job of, uh, of aligning it into two large categories. So this is an example of a deep retrofit that we're involved with. Um, this is a heavily stranded asset at the moment. It's using way more energy than it should be. Um, and the plan with this one is to, at some point when there's a lease break, when all the tenants are out of the building, to do a really sort of thorough job of retrofitting it, taking the facade off, building an extension to fund a lot of it, um, and then reduce the energy consumption down to a very low level through all the sort of things that neighbors and the operational carbon element deals with. The, the risk of this kind of approach is that you've got an awful lot of em excess emissions until you, until you actually decide to do it. So um, by leaving that time at a high um, emissions kind of state, then you potentially blow your kind of carbon budget for the rest of the, the time. And the second part that CREM doesn't really address is the embodied carbon of it. So you would see a huge spike in embodied carbon around the construction period as all of the um, the materials that go into that, that deep retrofit get emitted. And this is the light retrofit approach, um, again from a, a, a real building. So in this case, you're taking a more staged approach. You're looking at kind of smaller interventions over time. Um, to keep it below that pathway, this is a, a, a better performing asset to start off with. So it's already on a, on a net zero pathway. Um, and th this kind of approach is, is generally the sort of thing that we get involved with. So we're, we're sort of auditing buildings across Europe all the time uh, and coming up with strategies like that. So are investors looking at embodied carbon? The answer is generally yes. Historically, they weren't so much because they weren't so good at reporting their scope three emissions. So that's the, the um, emissions related to the materials. Um, these days, they, they definitely are moving more towards that. Again, reg regulation is driving that. Um, and that means that they are caring, caring more about embodied carbon. Um, is the other the other factor that drives in, that drives investors is the the actual price of carbon. A lot of the carbon that goes into a, a development project, as I'm sure many of you are aware, is offset. Um, without going into the whether or not that's a good idea, they are paying for it, um, and the cost of that is likely to go up. The other one is tenants. So I won't go into this, but tenants generally want everything, um, particularly at the top end of the office market. They need everything. Nearly done. So yeah, I guess what I'm what I'm trying to get across is that there is a whole raft of of uh, drivers for retrofit across the real estate industry and therefore across the construction industry. So it's being driven very strongly by regulation, particularly in Europe. Less so in this country, obviously, because our government, previous government, decided to kind of disconnect from that. But the investor world, 
covers Europe and the UK. It's very rare that you have just UK investors at, at the kind of scale that I operate in. So they were applying EU approaches anyway, um, and hopefully the new government will kind of carry on with that. Um, the investor goals, particularly at, at, at a very high level, pension funds, investment funds, are, are very keen to ensure that their risk um, of investing in real estate is minimized. Um, tenants want the best uh, of everything, particularly at the top end, um, and therefore the kind of owners of of those buildings are, are trying to appeal to that. Um, and finally, I mean, I came from a design team where I was banging my head against the wall with sustainability for a very long time. I think there is a, there's a strong groundswell of sustainability that has always sort of been there, and now it's, it's aligning with actually wh what the money wants as well. So we're in a bit of a pause at the moment because the economy's not great, but there is a long list of retrofit projects queuing up in the, in the real estate world that will require architects and engineers to deal with it. So we just need to get on with it quickly. That's me. So Darcy is a project architect and co-founder of the Mark Sparfield Architects Climate Action Group. Um, and having just completed a low-carbon commercial retrofit, the donor building, and orchestrating the reuse of materials, she continues to advance circularity within practice and is developing a deconstruction pocketbook in collaboration with demolition contractors, along with a series of schemes for reuse material hubs in London. So Darcy, can you tell us all about it? I won't go on about all the, the hubs and the pocketbooks, but I'll uh, yeah, try not to waffle on too much. Uh, lovely to meet you all. There we go. So I'm going to talk about how, with our clients very much hand in hand, we were trying to achieve tangible ESG-based outcomes. So yeah, I'm from Marks Barfield Architects. Um, I'm very lucky in that we're led by Julia Barfield, who is a leader in sustainability and an inspiration. Um, so I won't go through all the figures Everyone kind of knows them, and it's thrown into everyone's faces all the time. But it's really the waste one which has struck me for the last three years. Uh, the 62% waste from construction industry is just, it's just crazy. And even if we weren't in a climate crisis, I feel like that's something to solve. <laughs> um, but yeah, in the last probably three years, we've been trying to become a regenerative practice. And the terminology of that is still, what it means is still be kind of being teased out. But it's, it's not just doing good, it's doing better and really designing in symbiosis with the environment, both be that the people, the nature, the surrounding city. Um, so we have been working with one of our clients for over 10 years, Lazari, and it's been very much a journey, a joint journey of knowledge sharing, upskilling, learning about the climate crisis, how we can best deal with it, how we can best make the most impact in our projects. Um, so we started off doing 82 Baker Street, which is a, not too far from here really, uh, retrofit and restoring the heritage of a commercial building in the city of Westminster. And then recently completed was the Lantern and that we reused as much of the primary structure as possible. We tried to retrofit the existing building, but due to ceiling heights and other issues with BCO, um, we had to rebuild. So, but this really kind of springboarded us into the, the next level of our relationship with the Lazaris. So they, an ESG targets were set by their insurers and funders, as Ed happily explained the, the details of it and the technicalities. Um, but this meant that the Lazaris created an ESG side to their business, and they got some consultants to write this huge long spreadsheet of all these targets and accreditations to hit, be that kind of biodiversity related, health and wellbeing related, certifications. Um, and we took it and, and as a design team decided, you know, we can work with them to really create some tangible outputs from that. Um, and we focused on urban mining, which is a huge buzzword at the moment. Um, but that's really just material reuse, both in situ in the building. Where we couldn't reuse it in situ, we were giving it out to donor buildings. We happily had quite a few community projects in our own practice at the time. Um, but that meant that really we moved to deconstruction, which is almost like a craft really. Um, and there were benefits to the local economy, creation of apprenticeships and jobs and social benefits through the amazing contractors which we used. Um, and then achieving the targets through tangible outputs rather than throwing money into the ethosphere 
of offsetting and carbon credits. So we were pushed onto this in 2019. We were trying to investigate what 97% recycled material on a project meant uh, when the waste guys were boasting about it on the lantern. And it turned out that actually it, it's just downcycling. A lot of these materials are like perfectly good raised access floor panels just being shipped off to Turkey to be deprocessed and yeah, downcycled. So we then, with our clients, underwent really a shift in mindsets and a behavioral change. So transitioning from a space-based mindset where their building is valuable to them just because of the net areas and the rents to a material asset-based mindset. So it's not just the space which is valuable, but it's the bricks, the mortar, the history, the labor, the processes, the people involved, um, the social environmental effects. It all has a value. And that's both a carbon value, but also a cost value and among other things. So yeah, our strategy really was moving from a linear to a circular economy. Um, so, yeah, reducing waste, keeping materials at their highest value for as long as possible. And we did this via a kind of host and donor building relationship. So, looking at these commercial buildings from these larger developers as donor buildings, identifying reuse potential, be that in situ or to host buildings, to smaller charity projects, and just generally upcycling and avoiding downcycling. This is a general overview of, of the last kind of four years of work and, and how we've been moving materials around London and there's been a lot of barriers um, and it's a, the process has been refined. There have been a lot of mistakes and a lot of learning curves but um, the donor building 22 Baker Street is the one I'm going to talk about. So this one was a, came along when Lazar ESG was set up so it was really used as an exemplar poster boy for the ESG which is perfect timing for us. The building looks like it was built in the Georgian era, but it was actually built in 2002 as a mock Quinlan Terry-esque office building. Um, and it, it had recently had a refurb in 2020. So it was full of all these basically new materials which had never been used because of COVID, and we just thought it'd be criminal. Um, and the caveat is we didn't reuse as many materials as we would like. We were the Cat A architects. Um, we didn't have access to the Cat B team because of legalities with signing contracts with the, with the tenant. So. Second time round, we pushed to get them on board earlier. They ended up building partitions kind of 100 meters, 100 millimeters away from where a partition had previously been, which is crazy and criminal, but learning curves. Um, so yeah, we had all the usual ESG and sustainability targets, things like renewable energies, health and well-being, looking at biodiversity, increasing biophilic design. But where we really majored on was the material reuse responsible demolition and deconstruction, really, um, and then utilizing low carbon materials where we had to bring in new materials to the building. So it was a long and a tricky process, uh, and we've since then we've refined it with the client, and it, this is our first time doing it. So a lot of time was spent up front analyzing the brief, doing site investigations, condition surveys, material inventories, which then informed the routes for reuse, which then informed some existing material passports, which we created a template for for the clients under industry um, initiatives. And then certain high risk materials, be them fire rated uh, or acoustic rated, we had to investigate further, bringing in specialists, spending time on site, really getting to know the building and the materials. And those materials we were locating elsewhere, we had to organize the safe removal and the reinstallation and the logistics and the, currently the infrastructure is not set up for it. So that was, yeah, a few scary moments where we thought we'd really lose some materials. Uh, one of the big challenges, and this was me very kind of blue sky thinking at the start, thinking, oh, yeah, we'll reuse all these fire doors. We can reuse them elsewhere. Yeah, there's no issue with that. Um, it was a long process. There was a lot of, I think I personally uh, served with those fire doors about five times. <laughs> um, but the, this really was brought together at the end of it as a culmination of how many decisions we had to make, how we have to de-risk that process. So initially, is the material worth being deconstructed? carbon reasons, cost reasons, program risks, because we don't want to give circularity a bad name from the off. Can it be reused in situ? Does it need repair? Does this need to happen on a rough site? Is the client aware of the cost? Is the contractor aware if it needs protection or moving around the site? So there's a lot of decisions to be made for certain materials, and the quicker we can make those decisions and consider them, then we can de-risk the process, make sure it's planned into the program and planned into the costs, so then at least reuse isn't causing a load more cost and complications further along the line. But thankfully, it was a really successful de deconstruction process, demolition deconstruction, um, mostly because of collaboration. And I think that's, that's key, uh, as we all know. But 
we had obviously client Lazari was very much on board with it. Lawmans were the demolition guys and they were astounded me really with their passion for saving the environment and they had all of the best intentions. And then Faith Dean were the contractors. So we saved more materials and reused more materials than we thought we would initially, which is brilliant. And that ended up having not just huge carbon savings for the project, meaning we can hit the kind of the whole life carbon targets, the BRIAM targets, the ESG, but huge cost savings for the clients. So we saved over £300,000 just from the raised access floors and the internal doors, and that's including all of the extra surveying, all the time spent from my side of things, um, auditing. Um, but that meant that it more than covered the elongated deconstruction process. Um, and then those materials we were donating elsewhere. So thankfully the client had a store in a building in the middle of London. Otherwise, I don't think any of these materials, they'd all be in the skip, which I think is a huge issue and a huge barrier to all of this, which yeah, we're really lobbying to change. But So we stored a lot of materials and they're slowly going off to all of our smaller community and charity projects, uh, one of which being Oasis Nature Garden. So we're looking to build this out of 100% reused materials. That's the aim. I don't know how many nuts and bolts we'll find secondhand and how we'll actually achieve that, but um, we'll see how we get on. It's very much a learning curve. So yeah, to summarize really, I think the timing is right. It's exactly what Ed was saying. Although, yeah, cost-wise and the economy-wise, we've got struggles, but retrofit and reuse first, we get, there's pressure from investors and funders. So from the top down, you've got tenants trying to meet their own ESG targets, but there's also pressure from employees and users of the space, and also from design teams like ourselves and from the contractors. Um, but more so, it was the external factors which really caused the the huge wins, so the spiraling material costs and shortages and lead-in times. If you've got your own material and you've got it's on site already and you don't need to pay for it, then that's a huge win. And then obviously the climate and biodiversity crisis. But um, no, overall it was a brilliant learning curve. I think the client and ourselves were much more invested in the materials because they were tangible. It was a process which we could, we could see and we were very much involved with rather than we're going to pay this much money to offset the carbon and don't worry about it. And then that's ESG sorted. So. Yeah, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I feel like demolition contractors are often like these unsung heroes in a lot of projects. It's like they really they, they know how to take a building apart. I listen to them. Um, right. Um, next up is um, Jan Katain. Oh, I've forgotten how to say. Right, Jan is a writer, lecturer and registered architect in the UK and the Netherlands. Um, and notable publications include The Architecture Chronicle, Diary of an Architectural Practice and High Street Regeneration, published in 22. Um, Jan is a founding director of Yankatan Architects and his practice is recognised internationally as one of the leading placemaking and participatory design practices with award-winning projects. Um, and the recent award includes the 2023 Social Value Architect of the Year. Um, thanks for that introduction, Smith. That was great, and you did pronounce the name correctly. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I straddle this uh, world somewhere between academia and practice, which is interesting because you can use the one to eliminate the other and, and, and the other to eliminate the one, which is what a lot of my research and writing is about. Um, I've come to the conclusion a, a while ago when I set up the practice with the ambition for it to deliver um, design outputs, but also civic outputs too, um, that we need to integrate spatial and civic practice to really start to address the environmental crisis. Um, as a practice, we often work for the public sector, um, we often work with grassroots organisations and through grassroots processes to deliver regeneration, and what all of our projects have in common is that they combine a spatial output with um, a, a civic output, whether that's education, whether that's better community coherence, um, whether that's environmental improvements, uh, or whether that's cultural deliverables. I'm going to present two um, case studies. Uh, the first one is the King's Cross Skip Garden. 
Um, in 2014, 2015, I was teaching at the Barlet, a degree unit with the amazing Dr. Julia King. And both of us had been working on environmental projects outside and, and public sector projects outside um, um, education. And we were really sort of fed up with the inward-looking nature of, of architectural education, where students look at other students' work look at who did well last year in order to emulate the work, who were taught by people who often weren't in practice, who were full-time academics, and at the same time, there were all these huge challenges out in the real world, and we felt it was essential that the students became cognizant of them and applied their creativity to them as well. So um, we decided to uh, team up with an organisation called Global Generation, and to run a real project with the students on a real site in King's Cross. And those are the students, um, and we were teaching rather than in the university environment on site, and suddenly their audience changed. The narrative had to change. How do I convey design if it's not in abstract drawings? And we ended up making lots of models because that was the common language that was shared between the students and the charity and the stakeholders that we were working with locally. Um, so, innovation was no longer simply linked to an artistic pursuit or an abstract narrative, which often is the case in, in architectural education, but to real-life challenges around acquiring materials, around time scale and program, around responding to community needs. Um, one of the biggest challenges for us was um, the fact that University education is about uh, rewarding individual excellence. In fact, collaboration isn't something that's ever encouraged or facilitated by the way that um, educational work is, is marked and, and, uh, and assessed. Uh, yet, as an architect and working in the built environment, collaboration is absolutely essential. I mean, anybody who works in our sector knows that sitting on your own, on your desk, and even if you do the most wonderful drawings, it's never, ever going to get you there. Um, so, collaboration, when you build something that's larger than life, and these are the students, you've got to physically collaborate, because it becomes unattainable on your own. And you've got to draw in others and recruit helpers when the project is too big, even if it's your mum, which is the case here uh, from one of the students. Um, and she's actually sewing, um, because that was one of the other challenges and one of the primary drivers here for this becoming a circular economy project, which was that we didn't have any budget. Um, so she's sewing up coffee bags, which were donated um, from, from a, a coffee roaster who, who would have otherwise disposed of them. Um, and they then turned into a building um, uh, afterwards. And that building also had um, the responsibility to respond to the community needs um, in, 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 um, in, in King's Cross. So there is an educational pursuit in, in the design process, in the construction process, but also ultimately when the skip garden was finished and when uh, programs were run and community could, uh, communities could access the work on site and, and really appreciate what it means to work with found and reclaimed materials. So um, reuse here um, was clearly an environmental, uh, had an environmental objective, but it also has a cultural significance uh, and a social significance in a way. So all of these windows, the student who designed and built this building, acquired through relationships and through third parties that they had to hatch out. They had to collaborate with an engineer because these structures had to stand up and be safe. Um, they had to raise their own funding, which again established them as a, a, a network. So ultimately, our students graduated with the design, with the built structure, and with a real wide network um, around the singular purpose of, of working in a circular way. The second project is um, the, um, the Canada Water Paper Garden, um, which was completed just last summer. 
um, it, it's part of the Canada Water Master Plan, and it was delivered in collaboration with that same charity that we did the work in King's Cross with. Um, so you can see here, that was the site we were given, and the objective was to build a garden for educational purposes, to grow food, and to bring the community together. And obviously in, in a shed without windows, there isn't really anything you can grow, but also that shed was uninsulated and cold, so it wasn't really a habitable structure at all, and it didn't have any windows. So we came up with this idea of decladding the shed and just keeping the steel structure and a little bit of the roof on one end, and then using as many reclaimed um, and repurposed uh, or natural building materials as we could potentially um, get hold of to rebuild under that roof structure there. So one of the technologies that we reinvented is a, a vernacular technology from North America. It's called cordwood, and it uses lime and wood logs, which we got from Epping Forest from tree cuttings and prunings, and they were donated to us on site where we dried them. And this was because of the availability of the materials, but also we knew what skills we had working with volunteers because the other part of the project was about actually building these structures with volunteers because we knew that testing and conveying the skills of working with reclaimed materials would have a massive impact ultimately, maybe much greater than the building itself. And working with woodlocks meant that we could involve uh, children as, long as, as young as six years old in the construction process because they're light, those wood logs. And as long as an adult mixes up the lime, it's not no longer dangerous for, for children to work with. Um, so, in a way, the building became a product of the materials we had, but also the skills that we had as well. And there's some of the teenagers who helped out. We had loads of teenagers helping out. And I really wouldn't be surprised if some of them wouldn't go into our industry uh, in the future once they graduate from high school. So we achieved 60% of reuse, um, uh, uh, retained or reclaimed materials in that building. Um, but much more amazingly, we involved 3,000 volunteers in it, each one of them becoming an ambassador um, for, for sustainable uh, construction and reuse. So there's the building. Uh, from the air. Um, just a few weeks ago, you can see the garden at the back where we kept the steel structure um, to, to sort of house it and enclose it. Um, and then the windows are all reclaimed, um, the plywood, and you can see the cordwood on either side. The other walls are made from the cordwood. And that's the garden, looking at it from the other side. Um, it's an organic garden which uses um, hugel mounds, and they're just Mounds of rotting wood covered the soil, and that way uh, they uh, have a really high habitat potential. That's the north facing wall. All the windows uh, were going to landfill, and we saved them all. Um, they had all been ordered by a developer that had gone under, and um, the window supplier had no use for them because windows are custom made. They're all wonderful double and triple placed windows. Um, that's a staircase from um, a construction site, uh, uh, porter cabins, um, and a lot of the plywood, not all of it, some of it we had to buy, we didn't have enough, but a lot of the plywood comes from construction hoardings uh, that we uh, reclaimed from the Canada water site. That's the interior of the building. The floor is made out of um, reclaimed door blanks uh, from a building in the city. And uh, here's the kitchen, and you can see the cordwood on the side, and uh, the window wall in the background. And then this kitchen, the whole kitchen was reclaimed uh, from the city bank. And um, the, the, the internal mezzanine, um, we didn't use plywood, because, uh, we didn't use plasterboard because we had lots of plywood, so it's all made from plywood and painted. Um, so what does that mean for the role of the architect and the designer in the process? This is the traditional sort of linear approach uh, to design and construction. You have the funder here, who sometimes is the same as the client, but often isn't. They might be an investor 
or they could be, in our case, this often a public organisation or public body. Um, so the client reports to the fund are mostly just about progress and level of spent um, and, and, pro and things like that. And the client then instructs the design team uh, and, and, and the architect um, and uh, there is really no direct link between the client and the contractor. That normally happens through the architect except for the, the financial uh, direction and the contractor advises the trades. So a message um, can easily get diluted in that chain of command and when other risks are at stake such as financial risks or, 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 or delay. What we did is we made our client on the paper garden project the contractor. Um, we made sure they employed somebody who was a skilled um, site manager um, but also had community built experience and um, the design process was a sort of negotiation between the stakeholders, the trades, and the design team, and the client, so that we were able to very quickly respond to materials that became available. And yes, it meant ultimately that the client had a lot of financial risk, but there was also a huge reward, because that building was built for around £850 a square metre, and it's got an EPC of A. Um, so it's, um, in, in all... Uh, you know, by, by all measures, an, an, an incredibly accomplished building for very, very cheap price. That's it. Thank you. Amazing. I'm, I'm sorry, basically, what's happened is that my antihistamines have abruptly worn off, which happens at some point in the day. Unfortunately, it's soon, so now I'm all sniffly. Um, sorry. Um, right, our final um, presentation is from Tom Lewis, Ryan Fid Lewis, um, who is an architect and co-founder of New Works. Uh, Tom is a chartered architect. It's, it's rare that I'm surrounded by this many architects these days. It's not really. um, um, and uh, between 2010 and 2024, he co-founded and ran TDO, a leading all services architecture studio which fe featured regularly in the architectural press. And in 2020, he was named the Architects Journal's 40 Under 40, a major survey of the nation's brightest talent. Um, Tom's passion um, is around innovation in MMC, modern methods of construction, um, and um, that work included Fab House for Urban Splash and the Low Line Arches for the Low Line Partners, which I'm about to hear some more about. Um, so Tom is passionate about potential applications of MMC and the lessons it offers for the profession's need for a more move towards specialism and collaboration, a founding principle of Thanks. Thanks, Smith. Um, so, yeah, I'm uh, Tom Lewis. I'm founding director at New Works. I'm going to talk about um, two projects, actually. So they are... Um, quite different in terms of the client and the brief and the um, the uh, the purpose and the users of the building, but they both um, have a, a retrofit at its core and also an ESG sort of um, driver behind the behind the brief. So I'll talk a bit about what that was for e in in each case. So the first project I'll talk about here is the uh, Lowland Arches. So the um, the project was a, um, the first built project for the low-line partners within the arches. So the low-line itself is a sort of series of cultural nodes that run under the railway viaduct, the Victorian railway viaduct, from uh, Bankside near London Bridge all the way down to, to Bermondsey. And a lot of those, in, those um, interventions have historically been uh, outside the arches, but th these projects were the first to actually occupy the arches. And... Um, the projects really work with this sort of sense of the found condition of these underused and, un and unused spaces, which are absolutely phenomenal once you sort of get into them and pull off the waterproofing. The, the, the sort of Victorian engineering is, is, is really spectacular. Um, so, and you can see on this map down here that the two projects I'm going to talk about, Great Suffer Yard and uh, the Lowland Arch, so are actually quite closely located in, in South East London. So the... The, the low line itself uh, occupies space beneath the viaduct, which runs right through the city. So you can see from that drawing in the bottom right that there's it, it, a whole series of amazing spaces that exist underneath the railway, which are largely underused um, throughout London. 
and the the low line is a, is, a, is part of the kind of purpose of it is to reconnect communities and businesses that exist around them with um, with one another and, and, and provide services and functions that might not otherwise be so readily available um, and it's, it's a really interesting proposition it's quite different to the to its sort of namesake the highline in New York which is sort of based on a almost more of a kind of tourist destination this is this is much more focused on the communities which it which, which it runs through um, and it, so it's much more about connection and uh, community and activation than it is about ab about a kind of tourist destination. So the the brief that we have for this uh, from our client really focused on thinking about the communities that this these spaces will serve and what those those functions those spaces will be, and the uh, the, the need to create flexible, demountable, reusable, sustainable spaces within the arches, which really explores the potential of the arches in the process. So um, our, our design process, or our design proposals for these spaces really work with a really simple and powerful form of the arch, which is a, which is a, which is a kind of very, very simple form. And the, this incredible sense you get when you're inside them of the, the, the infrastructure overhead and the, the, the sort of tension that creates in the, in the, in the space. So our, our proposals, pulled away from the edge of the, the arches and we, we proposed like uh, spaces within the spaces so we used um, Nissan sheds which are developed as, uh, between the walls as uh, the kind of very quickly deployable very efficient low cost low tech um, shelters and are now used largely as agricultural buildings if you were to, to buy them now so we, we bought these off the shelf and then adapted them to form these um, these different spaces and the, the, the beauty of um, Nissan sheds is they're very simple to put together and extremely material efficient um, and, all, and equally simple to take apart and reuse and redeploy. So um, we, we started to adapt them to allow them to be placed on the floor basically with um, sort of heavy feet that you can then take apart and reuse in, in different arches. And that allows us to really show off the, 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 this incredible Victorian brickwork, which is the sort of thing you'd never you'd never build now, but it, it exists and it, when you can actually see it and be in, in those spaces. Um, it, it, it feels really powerful. So pulling the pulling the fit out away from the edges really allowed us to sort of explore that and create that tension, but also means that the whole fit out is demountable. So there's no there's nothing fixed to the edges that has to kind of go in the bin when it when it gets taken apart. Um, and, and and the thinking behind that really was sort of linked to railway arch leases, which tend to be sort of three to five years and and kind of again then renew. So there's a there's big potential for railway arches to kind of be stripped out and the fit outs to be lost. So the the design allows for the um, the, the, the proposals to be taken down and then reassembled in another arch. Um, so, so yeah, the, the, the scheme is um, is now built. There's two two sites are built. We're, we're just starting on a third. Um, the um, low tech sort of repeatable nature of the design has meant that it, it's 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 adapted already through different uh, several different uses. So it was designed to you know, part of the intention was that it could be adaptable and change use. So the the top less, less space you can see there started out as a community space and is now a, a bike hub. So it's a, it's, it's a space for Better Bankside, who are a local business improvement district, and they uh, provide bike facilities there. So if you're a local business, you can you can have like a huge bike hub and, and shower facilities in there. Last mile delivery service also operates from there. Um, and, and those spaces have changed function already. So it's, it, it's, it's sort of demonstrating its adaptability. And the, the larger space on the right is a flexible community space. So that's a space which is... Um, Provided all sorts of different functions already, so we've. This, I think it's been like a host classes, events. It was a polling station at the election. It's been a gallery, meeting space, all sorts of different things, um, through just a, being a really kind of simple open space. Um, and uh, so, I, I, I mentioned, I mentioned part of the brief at the outset was a, um, a good practice guide. So, the uh, our client on this obviously is kind of very keen that these. Um, community functions are served, that the buildings are demountable, reusable, and have a very low impact, but also wanted to capture all that learning in a good practice guide, So we, we've, which we've now done. Um, and each iteration of this design, which we're kind of repeatedly kind of doing, um, is getting lower tech and simpler and using more and more sustainable materials as we go through it. And that's all captured in, the, in this good practice guide, which will be free to download and use um, and publish later this year. So the, the, the second project is uh, Great Suffolk Yard, which is a workspace, uh, a, a, an office scheme in, um, uh, in, in, we can see where it is, it's just on the bottom left there, so it's sort of near the Tate Modern kind of area on Bankside, just more towards Borough. And the scheme here was um, 
a, a workspace scheme that we, we picked up or were working for a, for a client of ours who had had a quite negative pre-app feedback by others for a demolition new build scheme. And we, we came to it with quite a different approach, which sort of really focused on blending uh, retrofit and new build uh, and extending, extending the spaces to generate the, to generate the kind of workspace that was required. So um, we started this scheme by uh, looking really carefully at the existing site. So it's predominantly two to three stories, a cluster of family buildings around a, a central kind of workaday yard, which is quite an interesting subject or, or borough typology. Very, very tight sort of yard spaces, and, and um, typically there used to be kind of warehouses that would be, would be around them, quite t tightly packed in together. Um, and so our, our approach here was to, to get to know these buildings, really understand them, and get on the skin of them, and then uh, work with a retention, uh, a, a retention first approach around this sort of central courtyard. So we, to do that, we um, we kind of for, we forensically drew the site. So we, we got to know the buildings really, really, care, really kind of intimately. We went there and um, these are all our own survey drawings rather than a measured survey. And we, we, we drew all the cracks and all the signage, all the, the kind of, um, and, it, and everything in the bricks, all the kind of character of the building that we could. And we paired that with our, our sort of uh, desk-based library research and, um, and our own kind of understanding of the, the sort of social histories of the site. And then that was all we took to our first pre-application meeting with the planners. So we didn't go with any proposals at all. We just went along with this the site as we understood it, knowing that the the approach needed to be a retrofit-driven scheme, and it was one that we wanted to just share an understanding of the site first, and then the next time we came back, we went back, started to go back with proposals, and that, that approach was was really successful. So the, the, the design officer on this scheme kind of visibly relaxed as we went through that process, and uh, it became a really a really positive um, collaboration. So we, as as we started to propose new additions to this to the site. We were we started from a position of understanding what the important parts of the site were in in, in sort of in terms of its social history and it's, it's also architecturally what each building contributes to the site and, and in the quality of each of those buildings and um, some of them were quite poor single skin low rise buildings that were not going to survive but lots of them had a kind of a quite impressive quality architectural and structural quality to them so we, we were able to keep them and as we as we started to analyse this collection of buildings we were able to make these moves and one inform the next and create a family of, uh, uh, of, of extensions and, and retrofit around this courtyard to, to make a sort of coherent whole. Um, so yeah, the final scheme just kind of was a, was a, was a result of that dialogue with, with, with Southwark and um, adding, adding kind of, um, rather than erasing the legibility of the, of, of the building and its, and its contribution to the streetscape. So here's, this is the finished scheme. Um, so, so through this process, we're able to add quite a significant amount of additional massing to the site. And um, you can see the top left image there is, is, a, is a sort of full retrofit of an old warehouse building. And at the bottom left one is where we started to knit in the new build into the old. And here's the kind of the, the, the principal street elevation, which is a kind of a, a re-establishing a quite a vertical warehouse rhythm on the street. Um, and that, yeah, so the scheme, scheme delivered a lot of... Um, uh, uh, well-being benefits as part of the sort of core part of the brief for our client, thinking about uh, multi-aspect spaces, natural ventilation, long views, a lot of outdoor space. So every space has a t its own dedicated terrace, and we've got yard spaces down at the, uh, the main yard space downstairs. Um, and the, the scheme went on to achieve a uh, BREM excellent in the new build. It's got a well-building gold and wild gold platinum scheme, and it's almost now. It was, it was, it was designed during the pandemic, so it's kind of a response to the. COVID era, a bit more kind of quite kind of uh, post-COVID office space or workspace responding to that, and um, completed. Uh, I think I want to say about a year and a half ago, and it's now I think pretty much fully let. So it's been it's been a real successful scheme in terms of the um, the ambitions our client had aligning with the requirements of tenants and landlords in this sort of um, in this post-COVID workspace era. Thanks very much. still here, it's still more than 25 degrees outside, it's okay. Um, <laughs> thank you, lovely panel.
Um, right, so I'm going to come to um, all of you for questions in a moment. We've got a roving mic as well. But first, I have a question for each of you. Ed, in the words of the Black Eyed Peas, let's get it started. <laughs> um, you mentioned a little bit about the kind of current economic climate and system, <laughs> um, such as it is. And of course, it is changing, and we're seeing like a lot of change at the moment. But um, you sort of you did talk about retrofits project retrofit projects being kind of increasingly attractive. Um, and I was just wondering if you could just kind of explain from, um, I love that you've kind of an engineer, then you've gone into this kind of investment world. So please, you know, be our mole. Um, what are the key catalysts that might kick off a retrofit project or different kinds of retrofit projects? What are we looking out for? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it is financial for, for our clients. So the, the main one is how you reposition that building as as something that's attractive to tenants. I think um, some of these projects, particularly the last one that Tom's presented, is a great example of that. Effectively, all of the the older office um, buildings in London are approaching, are, are becoming brown assets, so th th nobody wants to buy them. So that's a huge catalyst. Um, something like 40% of the commercial buildings in this country are owned by asset managers. Um, and they've all got the same problem. And the only way they're going to differentiate themselves is by retrofitting. So that could be something fairly light if they're in a relatively good energy space. Um, but it could be a fairly major extension to kind of fund it as, as that yeah. kind of represents. I mean, that graph that you showed was pretty chilling, um, I guess. Like, there's, there's more and more pressure. Well, we've got to act sooner because otherwise this stuff is going to become useless and of, of no value. Um, and I think when we're looking at the kind of st a general state of repair of a lot of our buildings as well, like, you know, it's only going to get harder. So there, there is that sort of pressure there as well. Um, Darcy, in the words of Taylor Swift, <laughs> if one thing had been different, would everything be different today? Um, yes, you will do each have a quote. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> It says nothing about your personality, don't worry. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, it's this, it's this point about um, how things need to be different um, from the off in order to sort of achieve projects like that. And um, you spoke a little bit about this already, but um, how important is it that the client from the very early stages of the project is kind of open to a different way of doing things um, in order to achieve those kinds of outcomes? Yeah, I think that's key. I think... It's kind of what Tom was saying. You need to take the time up front with the client to do a kind of deep and dirty forensic analysis of the building, get them to fall in love with their building and their materials, and then identify the low-hanging fruit, de-risk it, because the one way to really ruin the whole process is halfway down the line, it turns out none of these fire doors can be reused, and you need to buy 75 new fire doors, and it's not in the program, and it just completely messes up the whole process. So de-risking as much as possible. And then if the client's on board and the, the design team's on board, it's, it's then finding your, your allies in the rest of the team and making sure that it's, you're fostering a, kind of a completely different process so it's not just a, a culture of claims and trying to kind of, where are the delays, where are the extensions of time? You're all working together towards that one goal and that's very much kind of a very kind of blue, ice thing, blue sky thinking. But um, yeah. Collaboration is key and, and changing the mindset and just, it's, yeah, behavioural change and a mindset change. And if you go into the project with that from the, from the off and you know where your wins are, then it's much easier to then actually deliver it rather than, yeah, halfway through the process saying, right, we're going to reuse everything and then freak everyone out and <laughs> turn them off. Yeah. I, I can hear that it's going to take you a while to get over that fire door thing. Um, that's, that's fair. <laughs> Um, but thank you for the for the beautiful segue there as well. So, um, yeah, in the words of Bonnie Tyler, together we can make it to the end of the line. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, it was it's really interesting. I really noticed watching your presentation um, how different that is to a lot of presentations that you see. Um, what you certainly used to see from like architects, and I, I mean, all of you sort of did this differently, but like there was people in every single picture, right, pretty much. Um, and it's really about sort of working together and co-creating those things differently. And I'm, yeah, I loved what you said about, like, I bet a load of these volunteers are going to go into kind of work in our industry and so on. Um, 
how much do you think that like the accessibility of being involved in building and in design is like a barrier and how much do you think that sort of being able to create a, a more accessible built environment is going to help us achieve some of these sustainability outcomes? I think there are huge barriers. We've got barriers in language, we've barriers in in process, we've got barriers in the timescales that we're working to, which people just can't imagine. We've got barriers in, in the culture that we have at work. The thing is, we've erected a lot of these barriers ourselves as a profession um, to a come across as professional and to protect ourselves. But there's got to be a real emphasis on um, digging us out of those barriers and breaking them down. I mean, one of them is is the sort of notion of placemaking, and placemaking has a very different meaning in continental Europe than it has in the UK. In the UK, we often ascribe placemaking to something a marketing team does to achieve higher sales or rental values, whereas in Europe, it's very much seen as a, a sort of grassroots activist practice that one does by painting carriageways in colors and, 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 and engaging all the neighbors in that. So language is something we need to think about a lot more because language excludes or includes other members of, of the community and uh, having open ears and, and listening um, much better will really help uh, with that process. Um, I mean, the great news is that I find loads and loads of people are actually interested in what we do. So there's a real open door. And if one does try to engage a little bit harder on the terms of those people that one wants to engage, then you get something back really, really rather quickly. And um, that's what's really rewarding about the process, and which is why I really love to do the work that I do, that you do get that reward back. I mean, there is a very, very long answer to your question too, and maybe um, I can defer people to my book, which has just come out, Londoners Making London, which is about recognizing all those people that are actually involved in making London who aren't professionals, who aren't architects, who with often very little resources and through stealth and belief and ambition make a real change for their communities. Um, and it, it is what we need to do as a profession is to start to recognize all of those people th that are making a change outside of, of, of our profession, which is what the book is about. Thank you. Welcome your plug. Um, Okay, and I'm sure if people want to ask more questions about that for a longer answer, then they can in just a moment. Um, Tom, in the words of Joni Mitchell, don't know what you've got till it's gone. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, it really, it really struck me that um, the... I think you took the Great Suffolk Yard project over like there had been a previous design team on it that had kind of done a, taken a different approach and then that piece of like going in there and drawing everything, drawing every crack and kind of almost trying to um, facilitate falling in love with that building, cracks and all. Um, and I was just wondering if you could say a bit more, like why does that work? Like is, is, that, is that an emotional thing? It's like <laughs> yeah, yeah no, that's a, it's, a good, that's a good point. I, th I think the... The, it, it, I mean, on, on this sort of subject of ESG, I, th I think if the, the environmental part is, is around retrofit, then there's, a, there's a, a strong social part that comes with, with buildings, what they mean to people, mean to us. And I think as architects, you, 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 can, you can sometimes um, uh, be, guilty, be guilty of just arriving, coming up with an idea, and, and sort of landing something on a site and, and then disappearing again. So the, in, in both, both those projects, um, it was really important to us that we understood the buildings like it, it, as as a piece of architecture but, uh, and as sort of structures but also how they how they contributed to the streetscape and what their social history was so their 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 the meaning of them to the communities that surrounded them and and that that's it didn't need to be a kind of 
uh, an everlasting exercise, but the in, in the case of Great Suffolk Yard, that you know, there's two very important street elevations there that we, we drew in a lot of detail, and that, that process of drawing them in a lot of detail really allowed us to kind of um, understand those buildings and, and start to have a relationship with them that the communities around them already had. Mm. Um, in the case of the Low Line Arches, the, the, the really amazing thing about railway arches generally is that they're, they're historically very low cost spaces and the businesses that have, and, and incubator spaces as well, so the businesses that have grown in them or, or, or exist in them have um, treated them quite roughly or have, have, have never had to think of it as a sort of beautiful white kind of box glazed office. It's, they're all they're very kind of rugged spaces and the, the, the railway arches have kind of over time developed this kind of patina of um, use, so layered, layers and layers of use and history in them, which you can see from the outside a lot of the time. And um, something that happens generally with railway arches at the moment, uh, you, you see it quite a lot, is that those old elevations get pulled down and you get a big glass frontage on it because they're quite deep and the, the light needs to kind of get into them. And then um, they get waterproofed and a slab goes down and then they become like a brewery or a coffee shop or something. And the, the, all that social history that we're talking about is lost because it's been taken away in place of some, something which has got much higher value kind of rental income. So in those projects, we were really respectful of the existing fabric, all of it. So um, there's inside those arches, there's some, there's some graffiti in there. We just left it. You, you wouldn't necessarily see it, but when you take away our things we put in, you, you, you will see it again. And the, the windows that we have got in there were old ventilation holes that we had the windows sized to, meet, to, to match exactly. So we were quite surgical about what we did and didn't do to those elevations. And it means that, that, that all of that... Some of it's visible, and some of it's just sort of just there. It kind of, you get a sense for it. Stays and uh, that history stays in the building, but also the, it, it, and it's important obviously for the low line that the relationship with the communities around the, the, the viaduct, that backdrop to their to everyone's lives is not just smashed and replaced. It's it's respected and kept, and I think all of that comes from that initial exercise of drawing things in a lot of detail. So you, you you're sort of part of that understanding. Yeah, it's it, it sounds quite. Uh Spabby, <laughs> is it the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings? You know, always like you know, making sure that anything can be kind of removed. And it's really interesting, actually, that those kinds of like heritage architecture, um, like morals, even like a kind of um, uh, are really like coming back with uh, a vengeance in a beautiful way and like being brought into a new context. So, uh, yes, lovely. Okay, um, hello everybody. Would anybody like to ask a question of our fine panelists? Or me if you want. Song lyrics are optional. Uh, I might have to skip the song lyrics. But um, I was quite interested in the kind of social element of a lot of the reuse kind of stories that were spoken about. Um, just from my own experience, I know that um, one of my colleagues is, was involved in the Oasis School. I think conversation in the pub um, meant that like one of our projects is donating steel to the Oasis School. But then we're also speaking about, you know, when we're looking forward at reuse, we're talking about a lot of kind of like AI technologies, softwares that are kind of recording all of this kind of possible material. But I'm trying to kind of understand how we move or how that connection works between the social kind of connections that mean that we reuse material to building that up to a larger scale where it becomes quite automated but loses that kind of excitement of it being a personal connection. I don't know if that's a proper question, but <laughs> where, where are we going? <laughs> yeah, no, I completely, I completely get that. I think even in the last three years, the first audit I did through our practice was I went on site, spoke to people, spoke to the tenants, spoke to the users of the space, understood how they use the spaces and whether their toilets broke very much and like really menial things like that. Um, and now we're very much moving towards, okay, the client doesn't want to pay for all that time of me wandering about on site. So there are all these amazing AI and initiatives who are going to go and audit it and scan it and use lasers and it's very quick. Um, I think there's always going to be a need though for that, that really transition between, okay, we need to understand the materials ourselves. The client needs to understand their materials. You, like, there is a danger of it, it all going into a building model and the client thinking, okay, there's my big building portfolio. Someone else can deal with it and I want 100% reuse, but I don't care where it goes, um, which I think there is a huge danger and I'm sure a lot of that will happen. But 
with the design teams, and I think that's where we really have our agency. Um, and as architects, our role will change. So as we start to retrofit and reuse, we're not necessarily designing new materials and new construction techniques, but we're reworking old ones. And I think it's our job and our role then to then bring in kind of the craftsmen, the local people, the specialists. And that's, that's where I find all of this very exciting, is that you get a real kind of sense, okay, we're now working together. We're working with people. I can actually speak to the demolition guys on site and they're saying oh yeah and no, you're crazy if you think you can re reuse that ceiling because it's got 10 volts per tile um and then we think okay what else can we do with it an artist needs it and we'll bring them on site and they'll have a look and think okay i can make a wacky sculpture out of it um so yeah i think it's up to us <laughs> to make sure it carries on i don't know if that was a good enough answer but <laughs> I think the problem that we have with doing it in a social way is that we don't have time to scale it like that, and there's just not enough resource. So that's where where all these technology platforms come to enable that. You, as Darcy said, you'll always need that hands-on experience because the, you need that hands-on skill to actually take these things apart and, and put them back together, and and that won't go away. But you need those those platforms, particularly around the marketplace for for secondary materials, because without that, without knowing what's in these buildings, and at scale, we're never going to be able to meet our embodied carbon targets. Yeah, I mean, I think we need to make the best use of the best tools that we've got in in a proper balance. But I think the other thing I'd add is like, let's there's so much thirst for optimization and optimizing everything. And actually, if we go too far down that route, then there's no space to like have those conversations in the pub that actually will then unlock something that actually creates a lot more uh, kind of efficiency. So it's sort of, sometimes I think there's like short-term thinking that prevents us from looking at things holistically. Anyway, sorry, I shouldn't be talking as much. Um, hello. <laughs> um, kind of half of the answer to my question in, in the kind of answering of that one. Uh, song, uh, Money, Money, Money by ABBA. Mm -hmm. um, Darcy and Tom, you, you mentioned like both of your in both of your stuff like you did a lot of early um, work like the, the survey of the building, the um, you know talking to the client, de-risking and everything like. Just in terms of practical, how, how do you get paid to do that earlier stuff? Because in my experience, no no client wants to pay for that feasibility stage zero, stage one. So, yeah, just in terms of practicals. Um, yeah, and there's a second part with the automation stuff, but yeah, well, that that's my first question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the getting paid part is um, <clears throat> yeah, good question. I, I think like the 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 way we 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 take that approach to all our projects. I think it, it's it's a it's a big upfront investment in the in time, in um, understanding what's going on. But it it pays dividends because we we feel like when we talk about a project, we're not we're not having to do any uh, post rationalization. So we're not you know there's no there's no temptation to jump to a solution and then have to try and explain yourself afterwards when it hasn't necessarily kind of organically got there through a, through a, through a process of interrogation. So that, that real understanding of a site is just, is just part of our design process that also gives us a lot of confidence. So that, when I mentioned that first meeting in the, in the pre-app where we, that's all we went with was that analysis. We, we sort of knew the design officer and we knew that his preoccupation with the site and his concerns about it. So we were just going there to share that concern initially rather than put anything on the table that would, 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 would prompt a negative response. So um, although that, that bit of time you could see as an extra amount of time at the start of the project, it meant that we were immediately into a really good relationship and the, the process thereafter was way quicker. So we went from um, uh, like that, that initial pre-application to, to a consent and it got consented under delegated powers. There's a big scheme to get consented without getting under, under delegated powers against committee. No, no real objections from neighbours. So all, all of that investment uh, up front over the life of the project was actually kind of worth it because the, the, the net amount of time we spent working on it under, this, under a fixed fee was significantly less than if we'd have sort of charged into stage two or three with a scheme that was kind of undercooked or hadn't had that benefit of that, that analysis. Yeah, and I would just tag on exactly the same. We spent a lot of time up front. A bit of it was pro bono, I would say. Um, we were 
creating new templates, and now the next time we've done it for the uh, other clients, it's 10 times quicker, because we've got all these material audit templates, and we know exactly what we're looking for, and we understand reuse and the practicalities of it. Um, but actually, it, it, overall, it, it didn't cost any more time, because in stage four, we weren't drawing a load of packages for doors and raise access falls and perimeter bulkheads and things like that. So we saved a lot of time, and there was a lot more certainty at stage four because they knew they had these materials. Um, and it means that then the next time we do it with that client, they've completely changed their way of working. They changed their briefs. They'll now turn around to their design, other design teams and say, okay, on this building, we want you to reuse as much as possible, and this is how you do it, and you can speak to MBA or whoever because loads of people are brilliant at it now and working really hard at it. Um, so yeah, I think it, yeah, it's an initial investment, but it, it, it paid off and it, yeah, I think it does pay off generally, I like to think. It sounds like it's about de-risking the project later on. If you can de-risk planning, then people are going to be more happy to sort of invest at that point or, yeah. Um, right, we're, in, we're nearly at the end. One more question? Oh. In the, Some mic um, behind you. Uh, evening standard today, where they, um, uh, which which showed a building in in Canary Wharf, which was being radically altered, and uh, it seems to me that we've got an awful lot of boring office buildings. We just don't want to refit them. It would be a good thing to actually do. A, some really imaginative stuff, partially demol demolish them, extend them in weird ways or whatever. There's so much opportunity rather than just a straightforward refurb, which a lot of these are. For example, Stag House at Victoria. I mean, it's, it's just as ghastly now as it was before. Um, and that's been completely rebuilt, uh, redone. Uh, hopefully, you know, the investors hope, no doubt, that they'll attract people there, but it, it's no way going to be as nice as a new office building, even with all the refurbishment. Doing something else rather than just refurbing it. Yeah, I mean, I also saw um, there was a thing about Lloyd's um, refitting their office buildings into social housing, for example, I think. Because of permitted development, a lot of um, office to housing projects, like that's that's got a really bad name. That's not necessarily like, <laughs> that can be done very very badly, but it doesn't have to be done badly. And so I think we do need to like think more about how like creative reuse, not just like for like reuse. But I don't know if anyone wants to. I, don't I, want to add. I mean, I really enjoy that this process of working in the circular economy requires you to invest yourself creatively throughout the entire process, and not only in the design, but actually in in the processes around um, contracting, tender, planning, all of these things. There is real scope here, I think, for architects to um, use their sort of lateral thinking to, um, you know, to reinvent the, the, the way that we work. And that's what I find incredibly attractive and interesting about working in, in the circular economy. And I would just tag on to that, that um, I think technologies and building technologies have, have come so far that uh, we were recently having a little ideas, brainstorm idea about, okay, a circular hub in the raw docks and we'd have an industrial material reuse warehouse on the bottom with resi above and we spoke to the planners and they were like, oh no, you can't have industrial mixed with residential, that's ridiculous. But actually, it's, it's happening in other countries. We've got great building technologies, great acoustic materials. Um, why can't we start to mix things up and just yeah, change the way we live and work and can it not be a kind of, not just a circular economy, but a circular community. And we need to have a bit more of a connection to where things come from and the way things are processed and what's happened. So I think being closer to it all is, is only a benefit as long as you're not woken up at 6 a.m. with drilling. But. Just one thing, if this is working. Um, there, there was a, a civic building in Weymouth, um, absolutely hideous building, um, but... They've demolished it entirely, but they could have kept two floors, and it would have been a, could have been a useful uh, thing. I mean, it was well built, uh, it's a 70s building, reinforced concrete. Seems to be no imagination, really. It's either there or not, and um, there's an awful lot of embodied carbon in these things, and it's already there. Something can be done with it if people are prepared to, to, to use imagination. Just really quickly to, your, to an earlier point about... Um, office buildings that are quite boring which we kind of sadly have to retrofit or 
you know, uh, 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 that challenge. I th we, we're, we're looking at a few of those, and, and I think where, where the opportunity lies, fortuitously, is um, if, you, if you can do it, the, uh, insulating buildings externally is a, is, a, is a better way of getting a high-performing building than insulating internally, partly because you, you're getting the benefit of all that fabric, but also you're not losing NIA internally, which obviously for workspace is, is sort of critical. But that, that external opportunity to insulate externally also means that you can really fundamentally change the appearance of the building if, if that's a concern um, of, of, of that existing building. So um, there is, through, through kind of a retrofit approach, there are solutions to bad architecture. Um, and... Uh, and because it, it's, it's not just the, in, the interiors that, 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 that we, we sort of need to think about, it's also the entire sort of envelope's performance, and, and that can be resolved externally. But obviously, that depends on things like where your red line boundary is, and um, you know, that sort of thing. A lot of I these, think... sorry, a lot of these buildings are just so boring. I mean, you change the outside, inside is just as boring. If you go into a modern office building in the city and compare it with one of these 60s or 70s buildings, you can see why nobody wants to be in them. And personally, I think just doing up the outside might look it more pretty, but inside it's exactly the same boring place where I wouldn't want to work. All right, we have run out of time. Um, as much as it would be fun to keep talking about boring buildings. <laughs> but maybe you can do that over drinks. Um, I want to end on that lovely thing that you quote that you just said, like, with a retrofit approach, there are solutions to bad architecture. <laughs> so with that, um, please thank my lovely panel. <laughs>